Today we are joined by Peter Blatchley. Peter was a devotee of the man who called himself Yogi Bijan from 1970 until 1987, when he was finally disillusioned by his close contact with Bijan and made a break from the organization. Peter was one of the early adopters of the Sikh religion and served as a Singh Sahib and member of the Khalsa Council until his departure. Earlier, with some of his Sikh colleagues, he formed the Khalsa String Band, published several albums of music, and toured with the band both nationally and internationally between 1974 and 1977. Recordings of Peter's original songs are still played in yoga classes around the world. He now lives in Bath, Maine with his wife, Johanna Harkness, a psychotherapist whose practice focuses on women who have experienced trauma and narcissistic abuse. Peter is the author of many published articles and his memoir, The Inner Circle, My 17 Years in the Cult of the American Sikhs. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome, Peter. Hello, my name is Peter Blatchley and I'll be speaking today about recovering from the impacts of a manipulative cult. Healing from the effects of a destructive cult is not a subject that can be covered in 30 minutes, but I hope this short presentation offers some useful material for those facing such a dilemma, as well as for the therapists and coaches who are there to help them. I'll talk a little bit about my own journey in and out of a manipulative cult. We'll examine the challenges and deficiencies one is likely to face upon leaving a cult and the need to address and then shed the cult's distorted norms and indoctrination. And finally, I'll speak about deeper healing, asking what in fact does healing look like from a cult? A question that really comes into focus when we address the pre-cult and early childhood experiences that may predispose a person to join a cult in the first place. But before I begin, I should qualify that every healing journey is unique, and I would not be so presumptuous to, as to say that what follows is a roadmap. It's really more just like a set of principles, perhaps, for healing, and the conditions that one is likely to face upon leaving a destructive cult. Regarding my own journey, I'll be brief, because if you would like to know more, you can read my memoir, The Inner Circle, my 17 years in the cult of the American Sikhs, which of course I am shamelessly displaying here. I was born in Washington, D.C. to a musical and financially stable, but not wealthy, middle-class family. My father worked for the State Department. My mother stayed home and raised her five children, taught piano lessons on the side. I was the youngest, eight years younger than my oldest brother, from a young age, I modeled myself after my middle brother, Alex, who was five years older, super intelligent, funny, musically talented, and possessed of an edgy, sarcastic wit that he exercised like a sword. I too was musically talented from a young age. My mother started me on piano at four. At eight, I auditioned and was accepted into the junior choir of the Washington National Cathedral. And the following year, I graduated to the Senior Choir, which also provided me a scholarship to attend St. Albans School, one of the top boys prep schools in the country. So far, that might sound pretty good. But what's notable about my childhood for the purposes of this talk is that I was one of the youngest boys in my class and was emotionally quite immature. Like most kids, I thought I was from a normal family, but normal was not necessarily healthy. Although I had no idea at the time, nearly everyone in my family exhibited traits of autism spectrum, and my next older brother, with whom I was routinely relegated as the little boys, was very much on the spectrum. The bottom line is that I had no idea who I really was. Sometimes I would gaze into my own eyes in the bathroom mirror without recognizing myself. Even at the time, I felt that this was a rather strange phenomenon. Further, modeling myself after my middle brother turned out to be not such a great idea. I was certain that everyone idolized him the way I did and that he must be tremendously popular at school with his classmates and teachers, as well as with the choir director. He preceded me in the choir by four years. So at the age of nine, when I started at St. Albans in the fifth grade, I was expecting to be treated with great deference and respect, basking in my brother's imagined celebrity and polarity. 
pop popularity, I meant. Instead, I found myself near the bottom of the social and academic ladder, and it was a status that barely moved in my seven years at St. Albans. There were two areas, however, in which I excelled and got some respect, music and art, and my sense of identity was largely shaped by these pursuits, especially by music. I started classical guitar lessons at 10, but immediately started playing folk and rock music on the side. Through middle and high school, I performed with various bands from a folk duo with a fellow choir boy to rock bands in which I played lead guitar or bass. In the summer after my freshman year of college, I dropped out to perform with a band I had started with some classmates. It was an excellent band and we got a lot of respect but at parties and other social events, I was utterly lost and uncomfortable unless I had a guitar in my hands. After a couple of years in the band, I started taking yoga classes with a 3HO foundation at the urging of my girlfriend. I immediately jumped in with both feet. I was convinced that I wanted to be a yoga teacher and that would be an identity that I could live with. Within a few months, I was modeling myself after Yogi Bhajan, the founder of the 3HO organization. And in October of 1970, while still just 20 years old, I became one of the first Americans to start wearing a turban and white clothes and taking the vows to be a Sikh. I was in that organization for 17 years, and though it ended in painful disillusionment, it was an incredible and enticing adventure in many ways with multiple trips to India in the 1970s and 1980s, learning to play tabla and sitar, writing and recording several albums of music, learning to read and speak Punjabi, now of course mostly forgotten, and many other amazing experiences that I cover in my memoir. But this talk is about recovery from being in a cult, which Yogi Bhajan's 3HO most certainly was. In his 2022 masterpiece, The Myth of Normal, Gabor Mate asks, what is healing anyway? He goes on to say, when I speak of healing, I am referring to nothing more or less than a natural movement towards wholeness. Notice that I do not define it as the end state of being completely whole or enlightened or any similar psycho-spiritual ideal. It is a direction, not a destination, a line on a map, not a dot. Later, Mate says, true healing simply means opening ourselves to the truth of our lives, past and present, as plainly and objectively as we can. This is a slightly different angle on a definition of healing that I have come to in my own journey, living in awareness of my authentic identity. This, of course, brings up the question, what is an authentic identity? Many people think of themselves in outer manifestations, such as their religion, race, ethnicity, gender, vocation, political affiliation, social standing, and so forth. And these are parts of oneself, but they are not at the core, a fact that is demonstrated in the qualities by which family members and friends will remember someone after they are gone. She was a good, kind, and caring person who loved her children and brought love and happiness to everyone she met is a much more profound statement of a person's identity than she was an excellent insurance adjuster. After many years trying to understand myself and trying to make sense of my reasons for getting involved in a cult, I came to the conclusion that for me, being authentic means behaving in an ethical way that reflects and honors my own highest values and ideals, which is like honesty, compassion, courage, selfless love, and so forth. Internal family systems delves into many of these same values or virtues and goes a step further, stipulating three layers of self. The observer self, that's the part that observes and is aware of the external physical world and the internal world of thinking and feeling. The authentic self, which is aligned in thoughts, words, and actions. And then the self, the I, at the core of our inner world, the unblended coordinator of parts, 
as the uh, Schwartz would say, uh, the eight C's and five P's, which are probably familiar to everyone here. I call them core values and virtues. That is compassion, curiosity, courage, clarity, creativity, connectedness, confidence, and calm. And then the five P's are presence, persistence, perspective, playfulness, and patience. But there is another dimension to this discussion the attachment style, which informs the behavioral adaptations that come into play in our interactions with the world around us. Although the conventional wisdom is that anyone can get pulled into a cult, I have never really believed that to be true. Many of the friends who started taking yoga classes with me in 1970 did not join the cult. Well, I did. What was the difference? What was it that made me vulnerable? I concluded that it was because at the time I had an ill-formed and weak sense of identity. Being a good musician and a respected member of a locally popular rock group was not enough to make up for the gnawing sense of anxiety and insecurity I felt about myself. Things came more sharply into focus for me when I learned about attachment theory. I immediately made the connection that my youthful angst and insecure sense of identity were tied to the anxious attachment style I had developed as an infant and young child. It seemed quite logical to me that people with an insecure attachment style would be far more vulnerable to the promise of a new identity offered by so many cults, while those with a secure attachment style, though they might be attracted on an ideological basis, would likely rebel and leave the cult when confronted with the manipulations of a charismatic and sociopathic cult leader. An informal survey, survey I conducted this year with a couple of dozen former members of Yogi Bhajan's cult seems to bear this out. More than half those who completed the attachment quiz offered online by the Attachment Project, that's at attachmentproject.com, reported having one of the three insecure attachment styles, most of them in the anxious category. Of the several who reported having a secure style, none had had a direct subservient relationship with Yogi Bhajan, and most had left the organization as soon as they witnessed his questionable behavior, which those who stayed behind pressed themselves in a state of cognizant cognitive dissonance to accept. I think it is safe to say that recovery from a cult is a multi-stage process that can take many years to unfold. Initial feelings of freedom, relief, and empowerment, as well as doubt, loss, and fear are to be expected. But it took me quite a bit of time to fully come to grips with how deeply the cult's norms had become embedded in my social behavior and way of thinking. In trying to understand my own process, I made a list of the many ways my relationship with Yogi Bhajan had impacted my life. I started with a disillusionment of realizing that my so-called spiritual teacher was a fraud and a criminal. At that point, everything about his so-called teachings and the community he formed around himself was thrown into doubt. When I left the organization, I quickly dispensed with the outer signs of the identity I had assumed in imitation of Yogi Bhajan. This started with my outer appearance, the white clothes, turban, jewelry, uncut hair and beard. But I was still deeply confused about much of the theological, philosophical and cultural indoctrination that I had bought into for my entire adult life. Was I still a Sikh? Would I still practice yoga or identify with Punjabi religion and culture? Having shed my persona as a yoga teacher, 3HO community leader, Sikh minister and devotee of Yogi Bhajan, what would be my new persona? And without the social networks of the 3HO community, how and where would I find new friends? But most of the challenge was I'm sorry, most of the challenges were less visible, hidden inside years of cult programming. For example, my sense of agency had been seriously compromised by 17 years of depending on Yogi Bhajan for most of my major life decisions. 
It was a kind of learned helplessness and dependency that left me indecisive and struggling to make autonomous decisions. Instead, when I left 3HO, I transferred my dependency to my girlfriend at the time, whose advice and revelations had been instrumental in my disillusionment in the first place. I was perhaps even less prepared to reclaim my role as parent of my two young girls, for Yogi Bhajan had usurped that role as well, dictating their education and even assigning my younger daughter her name, one of his standard protocols of manipulation and control. After nearly two decades of practicing emotional denial as a spiritual virtue, I also discovered over time how emotionally disconnected I had become, often substituting for genuine emotions the spiritual platitudes I had learned to live by. In fact, I was incredibly immature in my emotional development, stunted from years of indoctrination and from following Yogi Bhajan's creed of channeling emotion into devotion. I also realized that my own ethical compass was seriously compromised by the example of end justifies the means thinking set by Yogi Bhajan when spiritual, organizational, and financial issues were at stake. Although I had already soundly rejected Yogi Bhajan's corrupt aphorism that there is no karma on the telephone, I still had a long way to travel before finding my footing on the ethical high road. In the last few minutes, I wanna outline some of the other challenges and dysfunctional norms one is likely to confront upon leaving a cult. First, compromised sense of ethics. It might be that participating in unethical or illegal business activities was par for the course. There's a need to reject this idea of no karma on the telephone and other e edicts that spring from an end justifies the mentality and justifies the means mentality, which is really quite common among cults. Then there's the spiritual philosophy and beliefs. For example, am I still going to believe in past life karma and other magical and mystical, mystical beliefs that many cultists use to excuse unethical and abusive behaviors? I think not. Then there's a sense of entitlement. I found that I had a sort of a spiritual superiority complex, a conceit that we as Sikhs were the blessed ones who are saved. That's a pretty common factor. <laughs> and there was racial and cultural sense of superiority too. Among many of the American converts to the Sikh way of life, many of them felt superior to their Indian and Punjabi counterparts. And then gender stereotypes and roles. Yogi Bhajan, created a patriarchal hierarchy. And those roles were imbued into virtually everyone in the organization. So there was a lot of uh, male privilege, female subservience and so forth. How is that gonna carry over into the rest of my life after I left the cult? Then we get into some pretty intense stuff. Social isolation. Social isolation, sorry. And the alienation from children if the other parent stays in the cult. This is a very common thing and it's really, really troubling. Loss of leadership roles and status within the cult. All of a sudden, I found I was a nobody. Alienation and damaged relationship with a birth family. This is very common where a person gets into a cult and the, they, the birth family kind of throws up their hands and don't know what to do and look down on the person or just sort of exclude them, write them off. There's a loss of friendships, and this is, again, very common. When I left the, the Sikhs, my very best friend refused to even talk to me for 20 years. More than that. I, and still, we don't talk. Our friendship, as it turns out, was based on whether or not I wore a turban, which is pretty pathetic. Then there's blaming. Many survivors of manipulative cults spend a great deal of time and energy blaming others for their problems. It is only natural to feel some resentment and anger, especially at those who deceived and abused us. But ultimately, blame alone is not a pathway to healing, for it is basically an admission that one has given and continues to give their power away 
to an abuser. Abusers should, of course, be held accountable, but healing ultimately is an internal process of recognizing and dealing with one's own injuries. There's practiced cognitive dissonance, realizing you ignored the obvious when it conflicted with beliefs and indoctrination. In some cults, anything goes if it is discreet, that is, if you don't get caught. And that's pretty much where Yogi Bhajan was at. Then curtailed academic and vocational education and lack of cultural literacy. Oh my God. Most cults have an anti-intellectual climate. Reading is discouraged. College and higher education are often deemed unimportant except where it would serve the purposes of the cult leader. So you might come out of a cult with nothing on your resume or certainly nothing worthwhile. Another aspect of cults is weak boundaries. People who get into cults tend to be highly vulnerable to exploitation by others. But then we also very easily fall into inappropriate behavior towards others. In 3HO, it was quite common for people just to spontaneously start giving somebody else an unrequested foot massage or an unrequested shoulder massage. And under the cover of this is just sort of what we do to show affection, there was an awful a lot of abuse of that at the same time. It's a very strange, strange thing when you come out of it. My wife noticed me doing stuff like that years after I had left the cult. And I said, oh my God, that's true. That's where it comes from. Then there's the impacts of the direct trauma. Yogi Bhajan, like many cult leaders, was manipulative, sadistic, and abusive to many of his students. His behavior was often traumatizing, whether through sexual abuse towards increasingly younger women and girls, through verbal and emotional abuses designated I'm sorry, designed to intimidate and degrade, or through financial abuses by which he enriched himself at the expense of his innocent and malleable devotees. When you get out of a cult, there's financial challenges, at least usually. No more earning a living by teaching kundalini yoga, for example, or working in a cult organization. Then there's the costs of housing and support. Many cults are communal I and mean, you don't have to deal with paying rent and dealing with your own food and utilities and all that stuff. And all of a sudden you leave the cult and you find you're out in the, in the real world. <laughs> it's not easy, especially if you have a broken home and now you have two households to provide for. And there's another possibility as well. If you were deprived of an education and vocational training, you might not be able to get a nine to five job. And you might need time for recovery from the trauma itself before you're even fit to spend 40 hours a week working in a professional capacity. Finally, there's a sense of shame, guilt, and foolishness that often accompanies leaving a cult. You might be looked down upon by family and old friends, or at least fear it, it's hard to admit participation in a cult. How stupid was I? It took me years before I would feel comfortable mentioning to people that I was in a, an abusive cult. I felt ashamed of it for many, many years. And then there's also the potential burden of memories of unethical or unkind actions taken at the bidding of the cult leader. And it's very common in a hierarchical cult where you're told to do something and it's completely against your ethical grounding, but you do it because it's for the good of the organization. None of these conditions is easy to face and taken together, which often happens at the point of leaving a cult, they do present an enormous challenge. Ultimately, I believe that recovery from a cult and recovery from developmental trauma should go hand in hand. As Lawrence Heller and Aileen Lapierre point out in their 2012 Healing Developmental Trauma, it is not always necessary to understand specific traumatizing incidents from one's early childhood. In fact, sometimes that can be re-traumatizing and counterproductive. But a person's attachment style 
can inform the kind of emotionally corrective experiences that can lead to a more secure sense of self, establishing a person on the path of what Gabor Mate calls a natural movement towards wholeness. That's all I have time for right now, but maybe we have time for a few questions. Thank you for listening.